uh, it's really annoying when you don't check and you do lithography or you're trying to clean your sample and you get to the point where you need nitrogen and you find out it's not on. It really sucks because, for example, if you, if you like drenched your sample with acetone and you don't dry it right away, it'll evaporate on your sample and that will actually cause dust and other things to accumulate there and you'll have this really weird pattern and you're gonna have to re-clean it. So, turn that back away. You turn this one on too. What's this one he said? Yeah, just that one. UHP nitrogen. Oh, okay. N2. Yeah. And so, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with valves. It's very standard. If this is the this is the flow, right? It's gonna come out. If this is parallel with it, it means it's on. If this is perpendicular to it, it means it's off. Because it's cutting off in this, you're opening the gate. There's literally something inside of there that goes like this and then will close like this and cl close it off. So, so just this one, not this. Yeah, none of that matters. Okay. And obviously this is coming out into here, so <laughs> don't open that. Just the UHP nitrogen. So now all the nitrogen guns will have nitrogen. And there are some other things in the lithography room that, that needs to be on for it to work as well. So let me see your samples. Okay. I don't know how well it's gonna work, but let's we'll just do it. Are you doing liftoff? Are you depositing chromium on all of these? Just the negative samples? We're not sure. We just made those, but we didn't know if we were going to do it. Like, you can take them either we're done with them. Oh, okay, so you just did like to practice positive yeah. and to practice yeah. negative, right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll just take the negatives. Okay. Positives don't do anything. Um, yeah, I can see. So basically, this means that everywhere where you see photoresist, afterwards, there's going to be nothing there. Everywhere where there's not photoresist, so all those squares, that's where the chromium or nickel or gold or whatever contact you deposit is gonna stay there. Yeah. Everything else will get removed. So what we should have is after we deposit in the thermal evaporator and then lift off, you should just have your bare, your normal film, but now you'll have these chromium squares everywhere, okay? So we'll just do this sample. This is the only one that looks good. Um, the first thing before you use any equipment, right, is to sign in. So let's go sign in. So that's the IC class. Do you remember what the password is? It's like one, two, two. Evaporator. What was the password? One one two two three three four four five. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now that we've signed into the thermal evaporator, everything should work. So right now this chamber is vented. I mean, is uh, pumped. So I can't open this. And there's nothing actually stopping me from open the, opening this. There's no locking mechanism. It's simply that the inside of this chamber is. Uh, so low pressure, it's under a vacuum, that all the air in this room is forcing this shut, and it's stronger than I am. I can't open it without breaking this handle. So, you click, here it's all automated, I love it. You click recipe, and it only has two options, you either pump down or you vent. It's already pumped down, we want to vent it, right? So you just click vent. Now, 
this shows you what the current pressure is in there. It's two to the minus two tor. Now you can see it's increasing. So what it did was now it's flooding it with nitrogen. And that nitrogen is building up pressure in here until eventually it will equal out here. In which case this will turn green and say done. And you can open the door. So we just wait. In the meantime, what we can do is come over here. So this is the control panel for your actual growth. This one is purely for pumping and defining like uh, the like sample rotation, all of that. But the actual growth is all done here. So I'm gonna this these buttons. It's not touch screen. It's just these buttons. Next menu. So here process menu and film menu are the ones that you care about film menu shows all the current like film conditions that exist we have copper chromium nickel titanium another form of titanium aluminum gold nickel chromium uh palladium i think i'm bad at chemistry anywho and then you can always make more if you have other materials oh you hear that click that means it's done. So you just click done. Now you can open it. So here it's pretty obvious this one is copper. You can see that it looks like copper. This second slot that's empty right now, this is reserved for gold. And it's empty because that's most of these ones we just let people use for free. Gold is expensive, <laughs> so we make people bring their own gold and put in the boat. So the way that the thermal evaporator works is you have these two leads. Let me actually, so if you click department, click this button, that opens this. It's uh, going very slowly right now, kind of anticlimactic. But, boom, there it goes. Okay, so this is copper, this is gold. So the way it works is these boats sit, we call them boats, sit here between these two leads and the material just sits in the middle. Now a clean boat, there are different boats for different materials. They have like different resistances because every material evaporates at a different temperature. So this utilizes resistive heating to heat the boat up and then the material that's inside will melt and then eventually start evaporating once it heats up high enough and the way it heats up like i said is resistive heating so it literally just runs a current a really high current through from one end to the other and this is the power supply here and you'll see this is voltage current and it'll this will automatically change the voltage and current to get the right power to uh, evaporate however much you want to grow. And back here is a uh, quartz monitor. It's literally just a little thin quartz crystal. And this apparatus is measuring its resonant frequency. So as you deposit, your material is gonna coat that quartz crystal and it's gonna dampen its uh, resonant frequency. It's gonna lower it. And the rate that that uh, resonant frequency lowers can be directly extrapolated to the amount of material that is depositing. So that tells you the growth rate. So you can define, okay, I wanna grow one nanometer per uh, second or something like that. Or I wanna grow one micrometer per hour. And you can tell it what material you're growing and it'll just use basic equations. Okay, if you're using gold, Gold has a certain atomic mass and a certain amount of mass that is dampening the quartz crystal will dampen its resonant frequency by a certain amount. So it's actually very accurate if you calibrate it correctly. Anyways, that's how it works. I actually forget which one is chromium. Um, assuming one of them even is chromium. I think this one is titanium out here. 
which leads me to believe it's this here. Now, we don't necessarily have to grow chromium. That's just what Dr. Xi said. We can grow copper, we can grow titanium, we can grow chromium. This isn't a real device. We're just gonna grow something and then lift it off, okay? So maybe let's just use copper, because I know that that's copper. It's the easiest to identify, okay? So the way that you mount your sample is you take this off, it has this slot and these two holes that you just stick it in like that. And we're gonna put it on here. You can see this is gold because I guess the last person who deposited deposited gold. Yeah, you can see this window is all gold. So let's go ahead and put your sample on here. So you have different options when you mount your sample. You can mount it on this plate, this extender, or you can take this off and just mount it here. There are pros and cons to doing that. If you mount it with the extender, that means it's closer to the uh, source, which means it'll grow faster. So you can evaporate at a lower power and grow at the same speed. The benefit of that being you don't waste as much material. So for example, with gold, that is really beneficial. However, there is a downside. The downside is because your sample is closer to the material, it may heat up because that boat gets really freaking hot. You'll see it, it's gonna be glowing like bright orange. It actually will hurt to look at with your eyes. And that gets so hot that it can heat up your sample. And if your sample is susceptible to damage, thermal damage, obviously that's a no-go. Sometimes with photoresist, your photoresist, if it gets too hot, can harden and it can make it really difficult to remove, then you can't lift off properly. That's actually an issue I've been running into. And so I, now, I no longer use this. We're gonna go ahead and use it for this. Um, and we'll see what happens with the lift off process. So for your sample mounting, there's also a couple options. You can use this. You just put your sample underneath it and then tighten it and that'll hold it there or you can use tape either way Oops. so yeah this was the best looking one but even this i think uh do you know what the sub okay it's silicon with silicon dioxide okay this makes it really difficult for me to see because silicon dioxide has this weird purplish color and it kind of looks like photoresist. So it's kind of hard to tell if something, if you completely remove the photoresist or if there's still some there. So we'll just see what happens. So just make sure that the clamp isn't touching your pattern. So I'm putting it here where there's no pattern. check by touching your sample see that it's not really going anywhere and you're good Boom. not going anywhere right. all right so another thing is because copper is all the way out here because we're using the extender, the deposition rate might be a little weird. You can see this, everything usually when you evaporate things has what's called a Gaussian profile, which means it's maximum like density is gonna be centered right above it and it's gonna fall off equally on both sides. Um, that means this sample is not gonna be in the center. So, it's really important that you spin your sample to get an even coating. Otherwise, the sam this part of the sample is gonna be a lot thicker than this part of the sample. So we're gonna spin it. Now, hopefully, people have already calibrated what this growth rate should be. But if they haven't, um, 
the film menu is where you really calibrate. So we're doing copper, right? You can edit and come into here and there's something called film tooling that basically determines the power that runs through it. It's like setting the internal resistance. And if you see that, okay, it's depositing too quickly. Like if you, if you type, I want one micron thickness and you afterwards you measure it, it ends up being two microns then you would want to turn up the tooling, which increases its resistance, and then it would uh, deposit slower and vice versa. And you have to just keep playing with that until eventually it deposits exactly what you say it should deposit. Um, yeah, so now that we've loaded it, the material, there's copper there. Close it, go back to recipe, just click pump down now it'll start pumping down so now this will probably take like 10 15 minutes before it says done so during that time let's set the conditions for our growth so I'm gonna assume that the copper is already correct so fill menu is for the actual materials process menu is for your growth specifically what you want to grow so if we come here, we can see that there already exists. These are like pre-made profiles. Here's copper. You can select it, edit, click edit again. We can look at it. So the current condition is they want to grow three angstroms per second. And they want to grow 0.5 kilo angstroms, which is... 500 angstroms which is 50 nanometers right so I think dr. she said he wanted to grow 500 nanometers half a micron honestly don't think we need to grow that much we're not making a real device oh wait he wants it to be kind of thick so we can do wire bonding I think honestly with the wire bonding I don't know if doing it on this sample is gonna help we have other dummy things that you can practice the wire bonding on. So let's just, for the sake of messing with it, we'll edit. And let's just do like a 150 nanometers. This is per second or per minute? This, uh, this will be the total thickness that I'm setting oh, okay. right now. So we're gonna set it to 150 nanometers or 1.5 kilo angstroms if my math is right. Feel free to correct me and enter. So these are the two that matter the most. The rate is the thickness per time. So that's your growth rate. Three angstroms per second. And we're going to grow 1.5 kilo angstroms. So theoretically, you could calculate how long this growth will take, right? It's going to grow 1,500 angstroms at three angstroms per second. So it should take about what, 500 seconds? Should, t should take about 10 minutes-ish. I'm bad at math. <laughs> Something like that. So that's fine. So you can see the growth doesn't take that long, like 10 minutes in this case, right? Um, the pumping takes longer and the whole loading and everything. But yeah, this should be good. So we're gonna do, once you've selected a material and you change this, you just go back to main. And now you can see at the top, it's going to grow a single layer, layer one of one, and it's growing copper. So we're good. So now we just have to wait for this to pump. And then I'll show you the steps to tell it to start growing, okay? So now we just wait. Oh, and here you can always check on the, uh, look at this, it's at zero tor, 0.9 tor. It's going to drop. Right now, this is using the rough pump. Um, and you can actually see the rough is highlighted right now. Do you all, have y'all learned uh, pumping stages for vacuums? Okay, so, you know, in atmosphere like air, there is a lot of stuff <laughs> in our air, right? There's a lot of particles. Um, now, if you want to pump down a chamber to say like, 10 to the minus five, like in 10 orders of magnitude from normal air. There's not a single pump in the world that can do it by itself. 
you have to have stages of pumps. So the very first stage, the pump that's really good at removing large amounts uh, and making it into a fairly small amount is called a rough pump. There are different types of rough pumps, mechanical pumps, whatever, uh, oil, uh, oil free pumps, doesn't matter. So the rough pump will pump this down to a certain like relatively decent level. Then once that level is reached, it can switch over to the turbo pump, what it literally just did right now as I was talking. Now that turbo pump is like a jet engine. It has these fans that this this rotary that spins really fast. And that and it's a bunch of alternating blades that are spinning that suck the air in and expel it out. Now, the reason you can't just turn on a turbo is because those blades, if there's too much material, will damage the blades and it'll go crazy and it can blow up. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So that's why the rough pump first reduces the number of particles in the air to an acceptable level. Then the turbo pump can take over and it's even more efficient at pumping and it'll take what is left and pump most of that out. And for most uh, applications, like in the thermal evaporator, that's enough. The turbo can get it down to a pretty decent level. There are some machines, like the, the molecular beam epitaxy out, outside the clean room, in the, I don't know if y'all have seen it in that big room. That one takes it a step further, and there's a third pump called an ion pump that uses a giant magnet and like ionizes anything that comes in it and has a really strong electric field and directs it into this like titanium or lead plate and it just embeds it in there and that can get it down even further to actually almost equivalent to the vacuum in deep space like actually my mbe chamber can reach a better vacuum inside of it than exists outside the international space station like if you were to open the door and step out aside the space station, it would be a worse vacuum than what's in my chamber. So, um, yeah, those are the different stages of pumps. So, yeah, now it says, so first it said turbo and now it says at speed. Again, like I said, the turbo is a giant like jet engine type thing that's spinning. So when you first when it first turns on, it's not spinning at full speed. It doesn't just go from zero to 100. It has to spin and slowly start spinning faster and faster and faster. So it takes a couple minutes for it to start fully pumping. So now it says it's at speed. Now it's pumping really fast. Now if you look at the vacuum, it's already 10 to the minus four torque. Now it's 10 to the minus five. Before it turned on, the rough pump is only able to achieve like zero torque like 10 to the zero or 10 to the one. So the uh, turbo is able to get it down to 10 to the minus five torque. To put it in perspective, I think atmosphere is like 10 to the three torque, 10 to the plus three. So this is, you know, eight orders of magnitude lower than here, which lets you see why I couldn't open this door. Cause literally, <laughs> Yeah, the pressure difference is like crazy. I think, and you could probably calculate based off the size of this door, the cross-sectional area, how many pump molecules are hitting it, bombarding against it. Uh, we'll tell you how much force is on this door. The strongest man in the world could not open it. Uh, a gorilla can't open it. It's way too strong. It's like being in the bottom of the ocean, you know? That's how much force is on it. So it's almost done. I believe it usually either gets to low 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six, and then that'll turn green. Uh, but it's really just a waiting game. Yeah, this machine's really cool because it's all automated. Normally, I have to, so you know, I, I just click pump down started pumping down by itself normally i have to manually do it like i have to turn on the rough pump watch the gauge when it reaches a certain level i have to uh turn on the turbo pump and open the gate myself and let it pump 
and like do all of it manually. And then the really annoying part is this growth. You know I, how I was able to tell it like, oh, grow this thick and grow this fast. And this will automatically adjust the power and show this graph and it'll automatically tune everything. Normally, I have to do that all by myself. I have to sit here and turn up the voltage and turn up the current and watch the quartz monitor myself and like play with it and keep adjusting it and watch the vacuum and like do all of it manually and then sit there for a couple hours while it grows and then turn it off at the right time so I don't grow too thick. But this does everything for you. Press the power supply. Then you come to substrate, click motor rotate, and then if you click that 0% per second, it'll bring up this menu, and you want to put in uh, 50, so it'll spin at 50% like it's speed. So that's the sample rotation. Then you come to department, and you just click FTC on, uh, PWS one on, that's it. Now you can see the numbers there. Now as long as this is correct, just click start. Also, I forgot to do one thing, which is kind of unfortunate, which was clean this window. So we most likely aren't gonna be able to see anything, but it is what it is. Anywho. So it's going to slowly start ramping up the power. And this graph right here, I think, is showing power versus time. So it's showing an increase. At some point, you'll hear a pop. And that's uh, it opening the uh, thing to actually start depositing. Uh, but yeah, anyways, now we really just wait. It'll ramp up to the full speed. Pop, it'll start growing. Like I said, based off my calculations, it should take 500 seconds, roughly. So, once it starts growing. rotation off and then this off. So now that it's green, it means it's completely done. So now we turn it off in reverse order. Power off, FTC off, go to substrate, just click motor rotate off, and then turn this off. And now it's done. So now we can come to recipe. Vent. 
And the vent is pretty quick right after the growth. So it should only take like a minute or two. So again, come to recipe and just put pump down. Now while it's pumping down, let's try to do some lift off. Stay right here. What acetone does is it completely breaks apart the like molecular structure of the photoresist, thereby removing it. And anything that's on top of it will be removed with it. So, for example, I'll actually just demonstrate on a different piece. Does this have photoresist on it? I don't think so. It's just these two. Just these two? Yes. Okay, let me do it on the positive. Uh, okay. Because these don't matter. Whether it's positive or negative doesn't matter. Acetone will remove it. So, look at it. Okay, it's not removing very easily, which means it must have been baked on there pretty hard. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. Oh wait, did y'all etch? You did? Yeah. You did etching? Okay, that's why. So, the photoresist is gone now. Oops, shit. That was an accident. Uh, that just ate away the plastic. Okay. Yeah. Okay, those samples don't matter, so it's fine. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> I've never seen that happen. That's so weird. I didn't know it did that to the uh, to the holders. That's really cool. I mean, it's fine. Um, so yeah, now this sample. Do you know what material it was that you etched? So what was there? So yeah, now all the photoresist is gone, and that's just silicon dioxide, and then I guess you just etched some of the silicon dioxide away? Interesting. Anyways, all the photoresist is gone. So let's see about the lift off. takes a bit Let's get a better light in here so you can actually see it. Okay, let's uh, take this into the lithography room. Okay. 
So you can see it kind of like rippling and it kind of having like bubbles underneath because it's lifting mm -hmm. off of the, uh, the film now. So it'll slowly start to come off. So things you can do to make it a little quicker is just kind of agitate it a little bit. And another thing that I like to do is actually just spray it and the, uh, the tension of the acetone hitting it can like knock some of it off like you see. And it'll start to slowly peel away. Like that. And then the last thing you can do on normal devices, I don't advise doing it very often unless you really have to, is to put it in the sonicator and just, you don't actually put it in it, you hold it and just burn, burn for like a second and that will like break up the, uh, the film. So we can just try that because this doesn't, it, worst case scenario, we ruin it, it's whatever. <laughs> like the pattern came off as well <laughs> and that's most likely just because of the resist wasn't very uh i it, when i looked at it i didn't think it was totally removed which means it didn't develop long enough um so what happens is when you develop the photo resist even if you see the pattern that doesn't mean that you developed it enough yet there may be still a thin layer of photoresist there where you don't want there to be. And if that's there, then when you deposit, it's still gonna get removed. So you need to develop long enough for all of that photoresist that is in the area you don't want it to be to be completely gone. And you have your, you know for a fact that the material, the underneath material is completely exposed. That way when you deposit, it'll stick to that material. So on this one, I don't think it was completely removed. You think the you mean like in this immersion with the developing solution? Yeah. So you see like the big areas, all of it's still there, right? Because when you develop, the big areas develop really easily, yeah. like that is removed. But those really small areas, the developer can have a little harder time getting in it yeah. and really like removing the photoresist so sometimes the small areas of your pattern may not be developed yet. And so you, uh, you take it out prematurely. But that's okay. At least you get the idea. And so, yeah, I mean, that's the basic process. We uh, deposited copper and lifted it off. So the last thing we can do now is just go use the profilometer and actually just go over this and check what the thickness of the uh, copper is. So remember we set it for 150 nanometers. So let's go see if it actually deposited 150 nanometers or was it different? I it's perfectly like right there along the line. Cause that was the edge of the pattern. 
So that pattern was like a square. Yeah. And uh, this is all outside of it. So all of that photo resist was gone out here. Um, just set it here for a sec while I dispose of the acetone. So it's like the waste bucket. sample with you guys the you have another one that's negative resist to the pattern on it so whenever you guys want I am you can come in and try to do it yourself you know do a thermal deposition and do the lift off thing and then measure the thickness afterwards uh, Sign in more than one thing at a time. Wait, should I stop that? No, not yet, because oh. it's still pumping. So you can see it's only been an hour and two minutes. Even with all the teaching, it only took us one hour. So that other guy was there for an hour and a half. Unless he was growing something really thick, which he usually aren't, he must have encountered some issues. Like I said, normally it takes me 50 minutes to do it. Um, so I'm just going to really quickly measure this and we can see what the uh, growth rate is. Now it's going below. We're gonna have to redo it. So, do you remember what to do if that happens? How, to, how to fix it? The angle. Yeah. So I'm just gonna push it a bunch that way. We'll see if that fixed it. If it made it worse, then you know to go the other way.
surface is really bumpy. tried to grow 150 nanometers and it grew 93, then that tells you the difference in growth rate. So either somebody could recalibrate it or you can just know that and then say if you want to grow actually 150 nanometers, just multiply it by that ratio, right? So. If you want to actually grow 150 nanometers, you should put in like 240 nanometers, and then it'll grow 150, right? So, yeah, anywho, that's it. are on you actually need to turn them off before you sign out and you have to start with the highest vacuum all the way to the lowest if you do it the opposite direction you'll destroy the pumps because if you turn off the lowest one first then the highest one won't have anything backing it up so you start with the high back 
turbo, turbo back, rough pump. Now everything's off. Now all the gate valves are like closed. Done.